Welcome along, lady and gentlemen, to an early Tuesday morning. It's currently uh, seven o'clock, just turned 7 a.m. I'm on my way to pick up a new bike from KTM. I've got myself a new loaner, a new two-week loaner. So I thought, let's invite you along because I've got a few things to tell you. And I realized that in the past, I've never ever spoken about my sort of biking history. I put a post up on Instagram the other week and I showed photos of most of the bikes I've owned, the ones I could find pictures of anyway. So I thought, hang on a minute, I've been doing this channel for eight years and I've never done a video about me and my biking history. Now a lot of people ask me what is my biking history, you know, and I say yeah I've been riding since I was 16, but I've never gone through all of the bikes I've owned and I thought this would be a great opportunity. I want to test out this new helmet camera setup with the Durango mounts and the Hero 10 on my AGV. So I thought let's bring it along, test it out and uh, we'll have a little chat about my biking history. I even managed to find some photos of my previous bikes so I can pop them on the screen and we can all have a good laugh at the bikes I used to own. If that sounds of interest, grab yourself a cuppa and I'll see you after the intro. So before we get into the detail, I just want to give you a bit of an exciting update. I found out yesterday, all over the weekend, I was invited by Mr. Alistair Fagan of 44 Teeth to come along to their new adventure bike test, be the fourth man of the 44 Teeth best adventure bike shootout. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I love 44 Teeth. I'm actually a channel member of 44 Teeth. So I'm a paying channel member of 44 Teeth. I like it that much. So I said, yes, of course, I want to come along and be the fourth man on the adventure bike test. So this is why I'm testing out this helmet set up, my adventure helmet with a camera, because I'm not sure yet if there's going to be any off-road as part of the test, whether I need an adventure helmet or whether I can wear my road bike helmet. But when you wear an adventure helmet, you've got the peak and it can cause some vibration. So I wanted to make sure, in case they want to use any of my onboard audio, that it's uh, of a decent quality. Give us a wave, mister. Yeah, I failed it. <laughs> so that's another reason to be out today. But the, the purpose of the video is basically, as I said, to go through my biking history. I've been riding motorcycles since I was 16 years old. You know, when I turned 16 in the UK is when you can ride a motorcycle. I think that's still the same <laughs> these days. But, uh, you know, obviously you can't ride a car until you're 17. So there's this year of limbo when you're allowed on a motorcycle, but you're not old enough to drive a car. I don't know how that works. But uh, yeah, apparently when you're 16, you could ride a motorcycle. So, you know, a lot of people, certainly back in my day, all of my friends, of course, went out and bought motorbikes when they were 16, me included. So the first bike I ever owned was an MBX 50. Now, I don't have any pictures of this one. This was a heavily modified MBX 50. Well, this one was sort of modified a bit. It was basically, I think, really, it just had a sprocket change. So it was geared to do 70 miles an hour. <laughs> but when you've got 10 horsepower, or whatever you've got, and you weigh, I probably weighed at the time 16 stone. You know, I was still six foot two when I was 16. So I probably weighed 16 stone on a 10 horsepower bike geared for 70 miles an hour. And this thing, I, I couldn't get it to go over 20. You know, it was that high geared, even thrashing it through first and second, it would bog down in like third. And I, and I struggled to do sort of 20 on it. <laughs> it was an absolutely ridiculous motorcycle. So there was another chap on Hailing Island, which I used to live, who had uh, a DT50. So he had a DT50 and he liked, he liked the look of my MBX. He thought, hang on a minute, he was only a little slight fella. He thought, hang on a minute, I could do 70 miles an hour on that. Do you want to do a swap? You know, it was like, it's like the old playground days where you'd be swapping motorbikes like they were playing cards at school. <laughs> so do you want to do a swap for my DT? I was like, yeah, do I ever? This thing's a piece of shit. <laughs> So we did a swap and I had, then had myself a nice little DT50. That was absolutely standard, that bike. 
two stroke obviously all, all these one two fives are two strokes and that was a great little thing that was a great little thing i probably i don't no idea how long i kept that bike for probably kept it eight months or so i think i probably kept it until i was 17 and could get a 125 so that was me done with 50cc motorcycles and I've never looked back. So when I was 17, I ended up buying, now I'm trying to think because I had a load of bikes when I was, you know, those first couple of years of biking, I had a shit ton of bikes. So it's possible I could even forget everything I've had. But I think from the DT50, I actually got myself an MTX 80. This is a Honda MTX 80, which is like a tri, a bit like the DT. It's like a trials bike style, you know, but an 80cc, no idea of power figures. I can remember sat in college daydreaming about picking that bike up. I was supposed to be retaking my, my, math, my GCSEs because I didn't do very well at school. I, you know, I think I got five GCSEs all left school and then I did a year of retakes at college to get a few more. And I remember sitting in my maths class daydreaming about buying this MBX 80 and what I was going to do to it and how great it would be. I had no interest in school. I was just daydreaming of motorcycles. So, you know, not a lot's changed really. <laughs> so I, I had this MTX 80, it was modified, it had, you know, it had the rear was all cut down on it. You know, I loved modified bikes even back then. So this was another modified bike buy and, you know, it's, it's not the best thing buying modded they learn illegal motorcycles that it was it was a bit of a heap um, I did keep it very long and I think I ended up selling that and buying myself an RD 125 an RD 125 LC the legendary that was my only ever LC I've ever owned I wish I could have owned you know another two-stroke LC but we'll talk about that in a minute but yeah it was an RD 125 LC I think it was on a a Y plate, I want to say Y plate, which is what's a Y, that's probably 84, correct me if I'm wrong, 84, something like that. No, it wasn't a new bike at the time because this was oh god, when was this? This is probably 88, I'm talking about 1988, yes, 1988, Chops is ancient. So that was a RD125LC in blue. I've got some pictures of this. This is me sat proudly on my RD125. It had the, it, again, it was modified. Again, I'd bought a modified bike. It had an all speed exhaust on it, which had been cut in half, all the baffles taken out, it had different reed valves in it. It may have even had some porting done. It was an absolute missile. It was an absolute missile, this bike. It used to power wheelie in second gear. You know, caught me out a few times. You come around the corner on the powered second, and it would come up. You know, when I was a 16 stone chap back then, you know, I was no little lightweight. It used to power wheelie unexpectedly. You know, it was a quick bike. I th I'd imagine I'd ride that today and still think it was a quick bike. That's how quick I remember it being. And uh, yeah, that, that was a really nice bike. I, I probably kept that for about three months. And then again, someone wanted to do a swap with me. They, they said, look, but as bear in mind, it was Y Ridge, eight years old, you know, well maintained. It'd been, I think it'd been, yeah, it'd been painted out. It was nice, but you know, it was a Y Ridge bike with I think fifteen thousand miles on it. You know, it, it wasn't a mint. It was a minter, but it wasn't a new bike. And there was a chap who had a, a three-year-old DT one two five, which was again, it's a bit like the MTX. It was a trials version of a 125 you know pretend trials you know you wouldn't want to do any proper trials on it and fall apart but it was that sort of look and being a bigger guy and you know, i thought actually that fits me better it's a newer bike i could see that that was a much more that was a much better machine than my rd i love my rd but this dt was much newer you know it was a much better swap he tried to get some money out of me as part of the swap but everyone everyone knew that this rd was an absolute missile you know it was the quickest bike by far out of all my friends or not just my friends but my not just for close friends but just people you knew of with motorcycles on Hailing Island you know this was the bike the quickest 125A round so he wanted to swap his uh, much more valuable DT for it and I said well, okay yeah okay straight swap there so I ended up with this DT125 really nice condition I think it was more or less I think it's more or less original you know a lovely bike and uh, I got no pictures of that one because it was never 
as close to my heart as that RD was, but it was worth a lot more money. So I think, again, I kept that for morning thank you sir I kept that for a couple of months and then I thought well, what should I get now <laughs> and uh, what did I get after yes after the DT my mate had a KMX 125 again it was immaculate lovely bike you know the KMX 125 and I've got some pictures of that here is the KMX 125 and that was just a, a really really nice machine and I think I only had a couple of thousand miles on it it was more or less like new that bike absolutely beautiful bike that was and uh, I'd like that now to be honest I'd, I'd like that bike now as I would the LC to, to be fair but that was a lovely bike and I think I kept that probably that was my last 125 I think um, I don't know how long I kept that bike for I think I kept it for a year and then I ended up selling it to a buddy but it, it was lovely that KMX really really nice and I actually passed my test on that bike so I actually took my bike test on that bike and on the way down to the, my bike test, you know, riding down to get to do my test, my speedo cable snapped. Back in the days when you had cable driven speedos, they used to snap fairly frequently, you know, and I was riding down to the test centre to do my test, which I'd booked and probably waited three months for a slot and my speedo cable snapped. And I remember riding down thinking, uh, do I tell the examiner my speedo cable snapped? And then he may say, sorry mate, you can't do the test. Or do I just try and wing it and guess what speed I'm doing? <laughs> I opted for the latter option because I thought I don't want to be down. And he says, no, you're sorry, you can't do it if you haven't got speed though. So I winged it, guessing the speed. And uh, yeah, I, I passed. I think I passed. Did I pass the second time I did my test? But that was the time I passed. And perhaps that was my second attempt at passing my bike test because I failed the first time. So um, yeah, I, I winged it on the speed. And <laughs> so driving through town thinking, is this a th am I doing about 30? Is this, could, I, could I even pull that off now? Then I had a full bike test and of course, once you've got a full bike test, you no longer want a 125. You, know, you, 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 want, you want to get something bigger. And I, I, I'm trying to remember whether there was any restrictions like there are now about what bike you could buy after you pass your test. I don't think so. I think you could basically buy anything you wanted but, you know, obviously funds were limited, so I was thinking, well, I quite fancy a bit of a 250. So I actually managed to pick myself up a TZR 250 two-stroke. A 250 screaming rocket ship. Now this was back, this was probably 91, you know, I'm guessing 91. I've actually got some pictures on the photos, which if I've got it wrong, they're, they're a bit give you a clearer idea of what the, what the date was but it might have, no it's maybe it wasn't maybe it was still late 80s can't remember but I had this TZR 250 it was a cheap bike it was, it was slightly cheaper than your normal TZR 250s and that should have rung a few alarm bells in my head really but it didn't I just thought I'd pick myself up a bit of bargain here it was a little bit tatty in places I knew it needed a bit of work and I thought I could do that work I think it didn't have a seat cowl it had a couple of little scrapes on it I thought I'll get you know I'll get that done I'll do it up, it's a bargain. And, uh, and it was, you know, enough mechanically, I never had an issue with that bike. But it turns out it had some dent, big Denso stickers over the frame. And you can see them in the photo. And uh, underneath those Denso stickers, the T's and R's meant to have like a little cutout in the frame. It's a wide beam frame, but it has like a little cutout, a little recess through the middle of the frame. Mine didn't have a recess through the middle of the frame. And those Denso stickers were actually hiding a rather nasty polyfiller job on the frame. It was obviously bent. It never handled, thinking back, it never handled, I'm taking this guy, it never handled particularly well, that TZR. And uh, I realised that the frame was fillered and it was probably bent. Oh, oh my God, what is this I bought now? You know, I dared pull the, the stickers off the frame for fear of what would come off with the sticker. You know, so I was like, I've got to offload this bike. It's going to have to be offloaded. I think I just can't check. You know, I think I just sold it for money. I don't think I did any sort of swap. I think I just said, take this bike off my hands. What you give me for it? And I'm not even sure the dealer spotted the frame. They didn't spot the frame. So I think I just traded that, had the money, and then my good friend at the time, best friend, he had a, he had a Kawasaki KR1. 
and again I, I love the KMX so I always love the, the, the quality of Kawasaki's just seemed to be a bit of a level above at the time oh, could you still say that today? I don't know but at the time they were sort of a bit of a level above and the KO1 had come out probably three years previously I guess the first not the KO1S but the original KO1 lovely looking bike my mate bought a second hand one I think it had again a couple of thousand miles on it absolutely look at this guy Christ how much road do you want? absolutely immaculate and uh, I've got some pictures of it here is my KR1 what a machine that was and uh, I bought it off him he sold I can't remember what he bought I think he didn't buy anything I think he just sold it and was going to buy a bike later but he never actually bought another motorcycle so yeah, I, I bought the KR1 off of him. Uh, lovely, absolutely lovely bike. I'm not sure how long I kept that. A little while actually. I think probably a year, which at the time was a long time for me to keep a motorcycle. And I remember having the worst tank slappers you've ever experienced. You know, those bikes were lethal. They were so flighty, they were so light, so powerful. If you were to open it up in sort of second or third gear on anything other than a billiard smooth surface, you'd get lock to lock tank slappers. I remember going down a road, a ferry road on Hayling. It's quite a bumpy road and it was a 60 limit road. Only like a, similar to this sort of road, you know, a very thin road. But the surface got a bit bumpy at one point. I remember opening it up and it caught wrong on the bumps. And I had, you know, a, a, a lock to lock tank slapper. You know, out of the seat that it, I managed to stay on, you know, when I'd finished I was sat on the tank. I was literally sat on the tank. You know, absolutely terrifying. The bike was crying out for a steering damper, you know, it, it was... People, the amount of people who must have died, you know, there must have been fatalities on those bikes, you know, back then. It, it was unsafe, literally unsafe. So I think I ended up putting a... I got a steering steering damper kit mount to it I think I've got a picture somewhere with a steering damper on the side of it so I remember I, I put a steering damper kit on it, it well, after that time I ended up on the tank I thought this is this is ridiculous so yeah I put a steering damper kit on it and that settled it down it should have had that standard absolutely lethal they were right speeds are going to be getting higher now I'm coming to the motorway so let's continue this but I'm at KTM picking up the other bike Pretty should have been well, here we go. I'm at KTM, Husky Gas Gas. They've actually got some sort of dealer training day, so they've got a lot of the bikes out and about. And I am riding away on the new Super Duke GT. I was going to ask if they had any luggage for it. Oh, do I want luggage? Do I want luggage? Uh, nah, I won't bother with any luggage. I've only got it for a week. And then it's going back, and then I'm picking up the Super Duke Evo and taking it to Cadwell Park for two days <laughs> for track day oh that's going to be good can't wait for that and the weather's looking okay for the track day on the long range forecast but we've got a week of this old girl so uh, I will be doing a review of course of this I've not ridden one of these in a few years this has now got a whole new display like the Super Duke GT 2.1 so it looks the same as the one I rode before but I think there's some electronic and tweaks but anyway let's get back on and let's talk about my biking history. I've just been on the motorway for the last hour and 20 minutes. I didn't record the rest of the video while I was on the motorway because uh, wind noise is a bit pointless. So I've just come off the motorway now and I've been having my Spotify playing via the Cardo. So uh, I was starting off with 80s dance hits at the start of the trip. It's now gone completely off piece now. <laughs> And it's making up as it goes along. I think I've got the best trumpets of the 70s <laughs> been playing. And now I've got a bit of Mission Impossible for some reason. Mission Impossible theme tune. <laughs> which is actually a tune which makes you ride a little bit quickly when you've got Mission Impossible theme playing. But uh, where were we? Where were we with my bike history? Well, I think it was the KL1 I was talking about when I was on the Northern. The KL1, I sold that and uh, then I got my first uh, big bike, if you like. It was another Kawasaki. Let's turn this best drums of the 70s down. What's this one we got? Is this a movie soundtrack style? 
So I sold the KR1. I can't think why I sold that, because I did love that bike. I can't think why I got rid of that. Can't, can't think, can't think why I sold that. But I decided I want something a little bit bigger and ended up buying myself another cheap bike. I hadn't learned my lesson by buying cheap bikes. There's a reason bikes are cheap. And I bought myself a Kawasaki ZXR 750 H1. This was the first of the, uh, you know, the ZXR 750. It's a lovely looking bit of kit. And I actually wouldn't mind one now, if I'm honest. It's one of those bikes I do keep looking on eBay, get myself another bit of a project maybe. But yeah, ZXR 750 H1, beautiful thing. Oh, I do love a Super Duke GT. I do love a Super Duke GT. What a thing. But anyway, ZXR 750 H1, it, there was two colours, there was the red, black and silver, which was never my favourite. If, if you're getting a Kawasaki, it's got to be Kawasaki green. So I had the green, white and blue version. Same car, I'll put a picture on the screen, there's me looking rather happy with myself on my uh, ZXR 750. And, by the way, that 1.6 L Sierra in the background was also mine. I was living the high life. <laughs> An A Reg Sierra. <laughs> oh, these things are so good. Now, this bike had quite a few miles on it. And as I say, there was a reason why it was cheap. I think it had about 32,000 miles. It was on a G plate. This was probably, oh God, 93, 94. No, maybe before then. 93, maybe, 92, 93. Um, it had 30,000 miles, it had a bit, of a, a bit of a cam chain sort of rattle as well, so I had a mate, we, we changed the cam chain on it. Uh, but it was great, you know, I loved it. it was, they were never that quick and they were a little bit heavy, but it had a really nice front end, you know, it handled beautifully. But it was a, it was a little bit big, a little bit heavy, and not massively powerful, you know, in comparison with today's standards, but I, I did really like it, it had those brilliant hoover tubes coming out of the tank which you think would have been some sort of ram air system but this was before you know the, the, the days of the ram air they were literally just for show they went nowhere they went nowhere they were just for show those big hoover tubes before the days of real ram air they must have been thinking about it but i thought hang on can't be bothered let's just stick the tubes on we'll worry about making it actually work later on the zxr h1 lovely bike I would like another one of those and actually after I sold it about a year after I sold it I had the police knock on the door asking if I still owned that bike and obviously I'd sold it on and I said no and I said no what's this about they wouldn't tell me but I think you know I gave I think I gave the detail I oh, did I give the details to the person I sold I wouldn't have known I think I had a receipt for when I'd sold it I still had the receipt so I showed them the receipt of who I sold it to so it's obviously something happened. I always wonder whether that bike was stolen, you know, whether I bought a stolen bike, because the police were asking questions, or, you know, or we'd been done something on it and they were trying to track down who owned it. Maybe I was still the registered keeper of that bike. You know, they'd never renewed the, the owners and, I, and it had been caught doing something and not showed up in court or whatever, I don't know. But, or it was stolen, I don't know. But I had the police knocking on the door asking questions about that bike. Now, one of the reasons I love bikes is, I think, because of my uncle. My dad's always had bikes, so my dad's always had motorcycles. So there's always been a little bit sort of coming down from my dad. But it was my uncle who was really into bikes and into racing bikes. He used to do, he used to race, I don't know what championships he used to race in. But even when he must have been sort of my age, he was racing in the 250 class, 252 strokes. And he bought himself a brand new KO1S. And he had that as a race bike for like two years, three years. It was all Stan Stevens tuned. And he had, my well, uncle actually had one of the dream bikes. I think this is why it's one of the dream bikes. He had an RD500. And I remember coming around my house on the RD500 and I was lusting over this thing. Absolutely incredible. And uh, he had it for years and years and years. And in the end, it was just left in the shed leant up against the lawnmower, you know, just abandoned really in, in the shed. And I wish I'd had the money to buy that bike. But he had it, he must have had it for five, maybe even ten years, just in the shed. Just doing nothing. 
and uh, sort of my big regrets I never bought that bike off him because I probably it would have, it would have been cheap it would have been a cheap buy and now of course RD500s 20, 22, 23,000 pounds it's just out of the price range now but I would love a big four pot two stroke one day maybe but they're all just too expensive now but anyway I got a lot of my bike passion from my uncle and he had this K01F which he raced for a couple of years as I say all Stan Stevens tuned he then gave up the racing and wanted to sell it of course he had all the original bodywork for when he bought it brand new so of course when you're racing you stick on you know you stick on fiberglass fairings or whatever so he had all the original bodywork so he gave me everything, bought it off him, cheap price, had all the original bodywork, turned it all back to standard and it looked immaculate because it had brand new bodywork on it. So it all looked pretty up together. I rode that around, that was nice, you know, because it, it was tuned, it had nothing at the bottom and then it, it would come on song and it hit the power band. I think he got a new power band for it, the old one wasn't so good, so he, put, he fitted a new power band. <laughs> but when it came on power, you know, it was, it was a rocket. It was a rocket and that was a K01S, so the later version to my old K01. So I sold the K01S and then that was it. I sort of gave up biking. I, I'd got married to Mrs. Chops with had children on the way and you know she wasn't happy about me tearing around on motorcycles so we agreed that I'd give up for a few years after the K01S was sold and I ended up getting into cars a little bit. Used to be into sort of fast forwards, RS cars had a few cozies and all of that so I was out of bikes well Greg Gregorio he always has had, has had a bike you know he's always had a bike and he was always nagging me because he's my brother-in-law he was always nagging me and you know, I'd go in his house and I'd see what bike he had and I'd be like oh that's nice but I sort of forgot about bikes really but he was always nagging get another bike get another bike and uh, I was like yeah I will I will do it I will do it anyway years went by and then I think it was 10 years ago 10 years ago I decided it was time it was time to buy another bike and I bought the CBR 900 the 1998 CBR 900 Fireblade it was a 98 what's 1998 what would that what plate would that have been on I can't remember so I bought the blade and then that blade you know I rode it for a season just getting back into feeling biking again you know getting used to riding motorcycles again and of course I'd only the biggest bike I'd ridden was a ZXR 750 the 1998 Fireblade was a rocket ship compared to that ZXR 750 so you know I, it took a while Greg we you know, went out a lot of riding together he brought me back up to speed again and uh, after that season I thought you know well, it's lovely as it is this blade I wonder if I can do it up a little bit and that's when I started doing some work to the bikes you know in the winter I chat I did a lot of jobs to it I changed put a VFR 750 swinging arm on it um, different wheel you know I'll put a picture on the screen this is the first iteration of Beastie so a lot of people will be familiar with this bike I had it featured in Fast Bikes magazine or it might be practical sports bikes I can't remember I think it's practical sports bikes nice some nice pictures you know it looked it looked really nice TT Legends paint scheme on it as well which was actually that fairing was Chinese fairing it was, a, it was a Chinese fairing kit and I said to them can you paint it in the TT Legends colours and I sent them some samples of you know photographs and they actually did that you know unbelievably they painted that just for my designs if you like so they did an absolutely cracking job and they sent, they sent enough paint to get, so I could get the tank painted as well. So I've, I've had a really good local painting firm and they used the paint that was provided from the Chinese company and, and paint, sprayed the paint as well, sprayed the tank as well. But yeah, that looked lovely. So I rode that around for a year. And then I think I had the next phase was, uh, it went for a couple of iterations, Beastie. And the next phase was getting rid of the VFR 800 swinging arm because it was a bit heavy, the single-sided swinging arm. So I went for the old RSV 1000 swinging arm and uh, OZ wheels, you know, made it a bit more of a track looking bike, you know. And then had the tail painted up by Wicked Coatings, but I didn't have any more of that original paint. So they sort of tried to match that paint as best they could. They did a pretty good job. And then as, as a lot of people will know, I decided to do the last iteration of Beastie and, and we put in 
the CBR 1000 engine into a new frame and that's where the YouTube channel started that is when the whole YouTube channel started and that I think was eight, eight years ago so I've, I actually documented that build of Beastie on the channel so I've got 26 episodes I think of the build series of Beastie and that was my first ever sort of serious YouTube videos I had the odd, the odd thing on YouTube but as you do but that was the first time I started doing something sort of semi-serious on YouTube it looks absolutely terrible these days of course it's just me with a GoPro walking around the garage talking about what I'm doing but um, you know a lot of people enjoyed it and it documented the build of that bike you know having the engine mounts done mounting the engine in it and that was the start of this whole channel that's where it all started I think by the end of that YouTube build series of 26 episodes I had about 800 or so subscribers I think by the time it was done so I thought well people like Bam Von Grumble had started on YouTube doing vlog style videos so I thought hang on what we do you know I've really enjoyed the whole creative process of editing and creating videos I don't want that to stop you know so I recorded the first test ride on the bike you know the first time it went on the road I rigged the mic up to the helmet put a GoPro on and sort of vlog the initial test ride that is uh, yeah that's pretty quick huh? that's faster than before without a doubt oh. and uh and then that's it it all started from there really so that's how i started on youtube and my whole entire bike history so everyone who asked you know how did i start what's my history that that is it you know that that is it i think that's and of course i've, sold, I know, I've had other bikes since beastie of course but that's all on the channel you know you, you know what those are i think i had the uh oh what did i have i had beastie then i bought a 640 ktm supermoto then i had the super duke of course then i, then I had the 701 the super duke then I had a, a 200 EXC at one point as well. Uh, <laughs> what else have I had on YouTube? Other bikes have I owned on YouTube. The 690 of course, the new 690, the H2, the GXXR 750 I had, oh, sorry the 1000, the L7000 I had when I did some work with PB. You know, all the bikes everyone probably knows about. So. But that is it, that is my bike history, so hope you've enjoyed that little uh, sneak peek at what I've ridden in the past and where I've got my bike experience from, but uh, appreciate it. I will be doing a review of this bad girl, and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, tomorrow I go with the 44 Teeth guys to Wales to do and be involved with their adventure bike shootout so really excited about that so I'll be doing my own video of that as well while I've got bikes there so I'm really I don't know what's going to happen from that I don't know how much I'm going to be in you know, their video or whatever but uh, it's, it's being a massive 44 teeth fan I'm just really pleased to be involved with it you know so there we are thanks for watching guys as always and I'll see you on the next video cheers this is power level one which is full power. It's bad, boy. I could do that all day. What have you done here? <laughs> I told you I was scared back there. I've never dropped a bike before in my life. Oh! Backfire! That's it! That's it! <laughs> Listen to me. Never mind getting beat up. Give me this any day of the week. <laughs> oh,